Falter Podcasts werden durch Werbung unterstützt. Das hilft bei der Finanzierung unseres journalistischen Angebots. Falter Radio, der Podcast mit Raimund Löw. Sehr herzlich willkommen, meine Damen und Herren, im Falter Radio. Sie hören in dieser Sendung ein Interview mit Rashid Khalidi, einem amerikanisch-palästinensischen Historiker und Buchautor. Khalidi hätte Mitte Mai an der Universität Wien von New York aus eine Gastvorlesung halten sollen. Die Universität stornierte den Hörsaal. Das Rektorat nennt Sicherheitsgründe nach der Auflösung des Palästina-Solidaritätscamps. Der Vortrag fand online trotzdem statt. Am Tag danach hat Dessa Schischkowitz mit dem Historiker über Cancel Culture für eine israelkritische Sicht auf den Nahen Osten gesprochen. Rashid Khalidi lehrt und forscht an der Columbia University in New York. Er bezeichnet Israel als Produkt eines zionistischen Siedlerkolonialismus, aber gleichzeitig auch als nationales jüdisches Projekt, als Reaktion auf die antisemitischen Verfolgungen in Europa. Eine harte, differenzierte und umstrittene Sicht. Was er genau meint mit dieser Analyse und warum Israelis und Palästinenser die gleichen Rechte auf nationale Selbstbestimmung haben sollten, erklärt Khalidi in der folgenden Sendung. Das Falterradio dokumentiert für sie die Vielfalt relevanter Narrative zum Nahostkonflikt. Das Interview mit Rashid Khalidi führte Dessa Schischkowitz auf Englisch für den Berliner Tagesspiegel, der dem Falter das Okay zu dieser Übertragung gibt. Hören Sie sich das an. Rashid Khalidi, um, thank you very much to, for taking the time now. Yesterday in Vienna you almost got cancelled in your lecture. Uh, it was only an online lecture that was possible. Is this something that happens to you more often now in the German-Austrian lands? The only two things that have happened to me, uh, one took place in France where a lecture that was uh, being arranged at the University of Nice was um, cancelled by the rector, the president. I don't know the reasons that were given. And I was not able to give that at talk at all. And the other occasion was as my book was about to be published in Germany and I received an invitation to give a lecture, I actually received two invitations to give lectures in Germany. My publisher advised me strongly not to come to Germany and told me that if I did the lectures virtually, there would be a chance they would not be canceled. But if I tried to do them, if they tried to organize an in-person event, it would be likely that it would be canceled and it would be pointless. My, my coming to Germany would be pointless. So I did one event in Berlin, which uh, I did virtually and which came, went off well. Can you understand what's happening there? I mean, it's you're an academic, you're a very well-known author and uh, academic teaching for long years at a very sort of prestigious university. What's going on? Why is Germany or Austria, or why is the world going crazy on this issue? This is happening because people who are terrified that the narrative that they have peddled for many generations will be challenged. It's very simple. And they have the political clout and the ability to impose conformity on the cowards and who populate the ranks of the politicians and the administrators. We have this in American universities where faculty members are being attacked publicly by administrators, where staffers have been fired. Three staffers have been fired at Columbia University by people who are acting at the behest of, of those who are terrified that an alternative narrative might actually be aired in public. That's what this is all about, to maintain a control over a false narrative that has brainwashed people for many generations. So what's and the not, false not, narrative? And, 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 pardon me? What's the false narrative and what's the well, narrative? It's a narrative? It's a narrative which sees Israel as, as faultless, sees the Palestinians as having no justification for anything they do, sees any supporter of Palestinian rights as a supporter of terrorism, refuses to see genocide when we when young people who do not pay any attention to the misleading mainstream media can see on their screens that genocide is being committed that children are dying that civilians are being direct attacked that 
healthcare and other facilities are being destroyed with absolutely no real justification on the claim of human shields. They don't want that narrative, that narrative which 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 is deeply embedded in Western societies, to be challenged. Uh, and they are they're very they've been very successful at the elite level in the mainstream media with our politicians in universities in fighting against a narrative that is gaining ground at, at the popular level, at the grassroots level, among young people, in the alternative media, in social media, but which is almost invisible in, in much of the mainstream media and in political most political discourse. But so maybe let's go bit by bit through through it. So first of all, you are teaching in Columbia University. There was an encampment on Columbia University's grounds on the campus. The Israel's Gaza Solidarity encampment has now been taken away from there. Can you explain a little bit what's going on and where do you think things went wrong or things went also right? If you say the popular support among the students is in solidarity with Gaza, can we say it like this or was there, was, is it more complicated? We actually have a metric, which was a student vote several years ago in 2020 in favor of divestment from companies that support the Israeli occupation. Overwhelming support. Over a thousand students voted in favor and several hundred, four or five hundred voted against. That was a vote. It was popular democratic expression of the opinion of the students who voted. And that was four years ago. I think that sentiment has shifted even further in the same direction. So there are many, many students who are very supportive of Israel, who are resistant to any challenge to the Israeli narrative. But there are much larger numbers of students who challenge that narrative. And that was proven four years ago, long before the encampment, long before the Gaza war. That happened at the Barnard campus as well, where they had a similar vote. That happened on the Brown University campus. That happened on the Michigan University of Michigan campus before the pandemic. All of this is years ago. So that was, that was student opinion then. Student opinion now has developed even further in the same direction on most of these campuses. There's a large minority that disagrees, but there's a large majority that ha ha generally has these views. So that's student opinion. Different universities have responded to these protests in different ways. Rational, intelligent, academic administrators who valued both free speech and the rights of students and academic freedom and also the rights of the minority managed to defuse these situations by talking to the protesters and coming to agreements with them. And many, many encampments have now been dismantled peacefully. Other administrators, I, I believe acting at the behest, not of the faculty or of the students, but of other actors, the media, politicians, trustees, donors, or some or all of the above, have chosen to act differently, to bring in armed police, to forcibly remove the encampments or occupations of buildings where these occurred, to use violence against students. 12 students were injured in the uh, storming of the building that had been occupied. Um, buildings have been occupied at Columbia maybe four or five times in the last uh, 50 or 60 years, since 1968. In 1968, police, the police were used to forcefully end a much larger occupation. Since then, there have been several other occupations which were resolved peacefully without any police intervention and without anyone being harmed. The administration at Columbia and other administrations chose to take a, a different path. They have harmed the reputation of the university. They, they created a, a, a almost a police state on our campus. For many days, neither faculty nor students could enter the campus. Police, security guards, administrators. They achieved the ideal of the neoliberal university. No students, no faculty, only guards and administrators. But so is there a limit for you that you see now radicalizing students on the campus? Because, you know, in Europe, we see, we see this like two, three video clips that are quite threatening. For example, this one student, Kimani James, who said Zionists don't deserve to live. So what do we do with this kind of radicalization where people can't differentiate also between political struggle and maybe becoming, you know, inc inciting to violence against everyone who signs up to Zionism, whatever Zionism? I think it's true. There were individual cases like that. 
that individual apologized and was disciplined. And there are, there are means of dealing with this without bringing the police in, without starting a, a huge witch hunt, without claiming that there's widespread anti-Semitism, which there was not. A large number of the protesters were themselves Jewish. The idea that they're anti-Semites is obscene, not absurd, obscene. Um, that's true of much student protest over Palestine in the United States. Most of the people involved are completely committed to nonviolence, are thoughtful, are simply exercising their, their rights to, to, to object to what they see as a genocide. Other yeah. people have different views, and they also demonstrate, and that's fine. I mean, we've had flag-waving, people waving Israeli flags, people calling uh, the demonstrators, the protesters, Hamas, terrorists. I mean, they can say what they want. That's, that's, their, that's their right. To, to say whatever they want. And it's the right of students, I would argue, to protest. It's certainly a tradition at Columbia University. I mean, Columbia University was the first American university to divest from South African apartheid after years of student protests. Student protests helped to bring about a divestment from South Africa by the university and divestment from South Africa and other responses to the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement helped to end apartheid in South Africa. If you think of your book, which came out now in German, so it's available to the German public, and it's very much about seeing the Middle Eastern conflict through the lens of Zionism as a colonial project. Right. And that also yesterday in your lecture at the Vienna University, you were sort of explaining it very clearly that also the early Zionists always had a colonial mentality. It's also right. where they were born into this time and world when nation building went on and, and Herzl thought, okay, let's let's try to use this template for safe to get a safe space homeland for the Jews. And you described this very well and there are lots of examples of course for that also. Do you think that you can put Zionism in the same basket as other colonial movements, or do we have to differentiate? I, I certainly think I think certainly think we must differentiate. I don't think any settler colonial project is the same as any other. You know, Ireland is unique. It starts in the 12th century. It's it's completely different from every other. England was trying to subjugate Ireland starting in 1171, and they never, they, 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 there's still a British presence in the northern part of Ireland. So it's unique in that respect. It's also the only European case where one European power goes across the sea to colonize another European country. So that's unique. Algeria is different. Each, of, each one is different. In the case of Zionism, it's different for multiple reasons. Most settler colonial projects are extension of the population and sovereignty of the mother country. Zionism was independent. It wasn't an extension of the population of Great Britain. Unlike Canada, unlike Australia, unlike the United States, unlike Kenya, unlike, unlike and I could go on and on, Rhodesia, all of these were extensions of the population and the sovereignty of the mother country. Zionism is an independent project. So that's one way in which it's completely different. Secondly, it's a national project. It's not. It's a national project that used a settler colonial methodology, but it was originally a national project. When when Herzl writes Der Judenstaat, he's not talking about a Jewish settler colony. He's talking about a Jewish state. That's a national project. That's what it always was. That's what it also is. So it's that's unique. None of the settler colonial projects that you can compare it with go to found a new state of a new people. The English sent English people to anglicize Ireland. The French sent French people to turn Algeria into three départements of France. It's fundamentally different. There's no national project. Now, some of them develop into the United States is now a national project. It's this nation state. But it started as an extension of the British crown. We have Carolina, King Charles. We have Jamestown, King James. These are extensions of the sovereignty of Britain. Okay, so that's the second difference, the national aspect of Zion. The third aspect is these are people persecuted in Europe by millennia of European Christian anti-Semitism. So this is not, these are not settlers going because the king sent them or because the French Republic sent them. They're going because they're persecuted in Europe. Okay. And finally, there's the biblical connection. There's a connection between the Jewish people, between Judaism at least, and the land of Israel and Palestine. 
I mean, in the book, I start with the with the letter of my my ancestor, Yusuf de Al Khaldi to Theodore Herzl, and he talks about. We of course we understand the link of the Jews. It's in the Quran, for heaven's sakes. It's in the Bible. We know that. Everybody that's that makes it different from Dutch settlers going to South Africa, or Italian settlers going to Libya. It's different. So all of these respects, it's unique. Obviously, it's entirely different. Was the methodology the same? Yes, they said the methodology was the same. They said this is the Jewish colonization agency, the, the agency to acquire land. They, they talked about this is a colonial project, and we will we will meet the resistance of the indigenous population. It's the, the methodology was the same because, as you as your question said, they they were they were products of a European colonial uh, mindset. The people who establish the Zionist project are all Europeans. Of the 37 signatories of the De Israeli Declaration of Independence, 34 of them grew up within a couple of hundred miles of Kiev. They're Eastern Europeans. They're, they imbibed a, a, a modern European worldview, which included settler colonialism as a good thing. Yeah. I mean, it of, of course also included persecution, which sort of gave a push to this whole project. That, that, those are unique aspects of Zionism. The, the aspect of the Bible, of persecution, of its national nature. That's to the origins. But now I wonder, because nowadays Zionism has now, especially in the last seven months, but very over the last years throughout this whole colonialist or decolonization debate, become almost like a, a swear word for a lot of uh, young people who are protesting now. And I wonder if... This total rejection that we see of Zionism now on the on the campuses, for example, if that is, in your opinion, the only way how to deal with this, or can we find within this Zionism that you have studied also, is there a place for a liberal democratic Zionism, as Omri Böhm would argue, or is is it doomed? Because the Martin Bubers who came a long ideological journey, but also called for a binational state and yeah. renounced Zionism in a way. But there were sort of a lot of people on the way who, who said, like, we need a liberal Zionism, or they are also calling for that today. Is, in your opinion, a place for that somewhere in there, in nowadays struggle for self-determination of uh, the Jews, of Israelis in Israel, and for the Palestinians who have a right to self-determination in Palestine, which is their homeland. Yeah. Can they there are can many we different establish forms of something Zionism. that works for both? There's cultural Zionism. There's <laughs> political Zionism. <laughs> you are sighing. Rashid, you're sighing. You're sort of like there, a thought. There's, okay. there, there's a form of Zionism which argued for a binational state. You, you mentioned Buber. The, the entire group, Brit Shalom, which included Buber, and which included Gershom Sholem, which included uh, Albert Einstein or, or Hannah Arendt. I mean, these are people who are close to that trend, which is, includes some of the most prominent intellectuals in modern Jewish life, 20th century Jewish life. It was a very uh, a significant, tiny minority, significant intellectually, but in numbers and political clout, irrelevant, completely irrelevant. If you look at the, the major leaderships of every Zionist movement, starting with Herzl, through Weizmann, through Ben-Gurion, uh, Zev Jabotinsky, they, they were in a different world. They were talking about political Zionism, which involved absolute Jewish supremacy, which involved a majority Jewish state in place of the overwhelmingly Arab majority of Palestine. That was a form of Zionism, which was, in, 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 which was exclusivist, which did not call for a binational state, which did not accept the rights of the Palestinians any rights of the Palestinians. I mean, the first Israeli leader to accept that the Palestinians are people was Yitzhak Rabin in 1992 or three, whenever he said it. So we're talking about almost 100 years after Herzl, the first major Zionist leader, a pers person in a position of power, who even accepts that the Palestinians exist as a people, is the prime minister at that stage. So there are many forms of Zionism. I'll go back to what I've said. Uh, a form of Zionism, which is binational, which accepts the principle of binationalism, might be a, an avenue to a resolution. But it represents a infinitesimally small, it, it represents and has re represented an infinitesimally small proportion of Zionists. The second thing to say 
is that if you want to look at where anti-Zionism historically has been rooted and where much of it exists today, you have to look within the Jewish community. Until World War II, anti-Zionism was largely a Jewish project of Jewish communists, of Jewish Bundists, of Jewish assimilationists, of people who chose to emigrate to the United States in their millions rather than going to Palestine in their very few thousands. The people who were Zionists were a minority until Hitler, until the Nazis come to power, until the Holocaust. This is what changes anti-Zionism from probably a majority position in the Jewish community of the communities of the world in the United States. It's not until the Pittsburgh Conference of 1944, I think, that American Jewish uh, uh, institutions shift over to being pro-Zionist. The New York Times was an anti-Zionist paper in the 20s and the 30s. So the project was a, essentially well, a mean, Jewish project. It was, of course, anti-Zionist before World War II. Sorry, so I was going to say one more thing, which is if you look today at where much of the opposition to Zionism, the real principled opposition to Zionism, it's in groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, Jews Say No, Jewish groups, groups of Jewish students and activists and intellectuals who oppose, who oppose Zionism uh, for their own reasons within their understanding of Judaism. I mean, it's also because it's uh, it concerns them, of course, also greatly. So that, that it con it concerns them greatly. You know, the Jews in the world, of course, are thinking about it, if they should be Zionists or not. So it's it's sort of home turf for everyone who has any kind of connection. But I was interested in one thing that you said yesterday at your Vienna lectures, lecture also, which I, I jotted down as Manhattan Project. So you were sort of explaining how Manhattan was founded on uh, Native American land, and by settlers from Europe. And, and of course, by now, you have to discuss what happened and what the history of Manhattan and how the settler project and colonization happened. And it doesn't mean that you will dismantle Manhattan and hand it back to the Native American tribes that lived there, or tribes of the people who lived there, when the settlers from Europe came, the Britain, British people came over. So I wonder how this relates to the situation in Palestine and Israel now, how we can apply yeah. your thoughts on Manhattan to how to solve the Middle East conflict. Well, I said before, every, every settler colonial project is different. Some succeeded in largely eliminating the native populations. And the outcome and how you resolve that situation and how you achieve some form of retributive justice is entirely different from situations where the native population was not largely destroyed. So in South Africa or Algeria or Palestine, you have a different situation to Australia and the United States and Canada. And so you have different outcomes. I mean, it still needs to, the, the, the injustices done have to, first of all, be recognized in all of these cases. That's the first thing. You have to have a reckoning with history, an honest reckoning with history. You cannot have the kind of denialism of, for example, the Nakba, which is so prevalent in so many quarters today. It, it, it's disappeared, fortunately, from historical writing. Israeli Zionist writers now accept that the Nakba was you know, caused in this way and led to these results for these reasons. They, they agree, in other words, with what Palestinian and other historians have always said. Which is actually, it's Nakba day today. I understand that. That's mm. one reason I mention it. Mm. At the same time, this, the myths, the leaders told them to leave and the, the, we, they never intended to do this and, oh, it just happened or whatever. Those myths are still prevalent in the media and still prevalent in political circles. Um, so the first thing is historical reckoning. There has to be a reckoning with history, whether we're talking about the Lenape people of Manhattan or whether we're talking about Algeria or South Africa or Ireland or, 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 or Palestine. The second thing is settler colonial projects can lead to the creation of peoples, of nations. United States, there's an American, there's an American people. We're all settlers. You know, my, my, my parents came, one came as a student, one came as an immigrant. But they're, in a certain sense, we're settlers. And that's partly the, that has to, there has to be historical reckoning with that. And there has to be some form of retribution for what has been done. That doesn't mean you give Manhattan back to the Lenape. 
I don't know where the Lenape are today. There are Native American peoples who are still in existence in large numbers in the, in the, in the, in the Midwest and in Northern New York and in other parts of the United States. And in every case, some justice has to be done, but you have a different situation where you have 300 million descendants of settlers and where you have only a few million descendants of the native population and a situation like Ireland or a situation like Palestine or a situation like South Africa, where there were very large numbers of settlers, millions. And the, the question then becomes, how do, who have become a people or have become, if you want, natives? You know, Mahmoud Mamdani has a question, when does the settler become a native in one of his articles? And this is a question that's different in every case, obviously. Uh, in a sense, uh, the, the Italian settlers in Libya never became natives, and they all left, okay? Well, in standing other cases, in... Standing in, in Tel other cases, just let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah. In other cases, as in Kenya or in what's now Zimbabwe, used to be Rhodesia or South Africa, the settlers stayed and became, as it were, natives. I mean, they became part of those polities. So you have white Zimbabweans, you have white Kenyans, and you have white South Africans who are descendants of settlers, but they are now natives. And the same is true in Ireland. Nobody calls the Protestants who were planted there by King James in 16 whatever. Planters. They, they were originally called planters, and these were plantations, and they were meant to take over Ireland from the native Catholic Irish. Today, they're, they're Northern Irish Protestant citizens who are natives. Not everyone uh, accepts it. Well, But let's say there was a peace said, treaty. One of them said something very true. Yeah. We, don't want, we don't want your, your, I forget what he said. It was a reverend, uh, one, of, one of the leaders of the Northern Irish Protestants. Yeah. We don't want your charity in accepting us as planters, quote unquote. We, we've been here longer than Joe Biden's ancestors have been in the United States. <laughs> Which yeah. is a good point. Good point. <laughs> I mean, one has, to accept, one has to accept that after a while. And I think that uh, it's going to be very hard for many Palestinians to accept. But first of all, there's an Israeli people. It is, they've established a national, they've succeeded by unjust means, which involved ethnic cleansing and massacre. They've succeeded in establishing a people and a nation state. And secondly, you have third and fourth and fifth and sixth generation. I mean, you have original, there was a, there was, there was a Jewish population in Palestine before. I'm talking about the people who came from Eastern Europe and the Middle East. You have fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh generation populations now. There's, and there's no place for them to go back to. It's not like the Pied Noir can go back to France or the Italians can go back to, 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 from Libya to Italy. This, it's not possible in this case for most of them. Nor, not only do they not want to, they can't. There's no place for them to go. So I, I think that a, a, a historical reckoning, as has happened in South Africa to a certain extent and has, has, is happening, I hope, in Ireland to a certain extent, has to take place in Palestine. Um, it's not going to be easy. The, the harm that has been caused to the Palestinians is so great and the trauma is so deep that that form of acceptance is going to be very, very hard. On the other side, it'll be even harder. The idea that the Palestinians are the native indigenous population and they have absolute rights to their own country is something that is actually banned by Israeli law, by the 2018 Israel Nation State of the Jewish People Law. You cannot express that sentiment, or you can express it, but... You know, it was a, probably introduced this law to establish that view in order to prevent... Exactly. Uh, You know, exactly. Palestinian sort of attempts to have a different narrative, which everyone sort of, it's quite obvious to everyone who looks at the thing that the Palestinians were sort of Similarly, living there's before. an anti-Nakba, there's an anti-Nakba law. Yeah. But I mean, sort of to come, because I'm mindful of the time, to come to the question, how can we solve, what is the, what would be a, a just solution for Israelis and Palestinians to have each a state or have one together. It, you know, it's a very hot topic and we don't have to solve it now in the last two minutes of this interview. But what, what is the direction to go? Recognition of Israel, recognition of Palestine and kind of an attempt to find a way for everyone to get civil rights and national sovereignty, maybe shared one? I have two things to say. The first is, Any resolution would, in order to be sustainable and just, has to provide 
in whatever format, one state, two states, binational state, cantonal solution, confederation, has to provide for absolute equality of rights. These include personal rights, human rights, civil rights, religious rights, and national rights. There's a national, there are two national entities. So I, I, I personally think that any, any one of the possibilities that I've mentioned, as long as it does not provide for absolutely equal rights, absolutely equal rights, if you can bring your cousin from Brooklyn, I can bring my cousin from Brooklyn. Well, especially if if somebody from Brooklyn can bring themselves, you should also be able to come. It's That's not my a point. Really question. That's yeah. my point. If I'm there, uh, exactly. If you have the right to worship, I have the right, and so on and so forth. That's the first thing that I want to say. The second thing I want to say is so much of what is said about a so-called two-state solution and which invariably fails to mention an end at a certain date of an illegal, violent military occupation that has gone on for 56 years and June will be 57 years and that doesn't talk about ending the ongoing, unceasing colonization of what's left of Palestine is not a two-state solution. It is a one-state and a many Bantustan solution. If you do not end occupation, end it, end Israeli control over Palestinian life. And if you do not roll back the settlement process, and if you do not allow for complete independence and sovereignty and self-determination, you are not talking about two states. You were talking about what Israeli leaders have talked about ever since Rabin brought himself to recognize the Palestinians are people, the PLO represents them, and negotiated with them. In his last speech, he said, we are offering the Palestinians less than a state, and we will have security control. That's not a state. That's a state, and what you now have, which is multiple Bantustans. Anybody who calls that a two-state solution is lying through their teeth. It is a it is a solution which preserves the status quo of one sovereign state and a group of Palestinians under its control who have a flag and a presidential guard and have no control over any aspect of their lives. That's the status quo. And that's been the status quo at least since 1967 and in fact since 1948. So anyone who talks about, who mouths the words two-state solution and doesn't talk about absolutely equal rights and doesn't talk about end of occupation, by a certain date, not in the future, maybe in 2080 or 2090 or 2222, no, by within a year, within two years, whatever, and doesn't talk about dealing with this the metastasizing settlement project that has planted 750,000 is illegal Israeli settlers in the West Bank and the, and, the, and the occupied Arab East Jerusalem. They're not talking about two states. They're talking about one state, really. They're talking about the status quo and then putting a little fairy dust on top of it. Does it worry you that in your lifetime, since you have been starting to teach, that you sort of basically, I think, winning the intellectual argument and maybe losing the one on the ground because of the political situation in Israel being so hardline yeah. now? Yeah, that's a good question, Tessa. You're right about what's happening on the ground in the sense that more and more land is being stolen, more and more people are being displaced. The control of Israel over the entirety of Palestine is being reinforced and grows stronger and stronger. On the other hand, it's not just the intellectual argument that I think has been transformed, such that almost no respectable academic says what almost every academic said 40 or 50 years ago. You know, the kind of narrative that passed for understanding in the 50s and 60s and 70s, that's gone from academia. It's still in the media. It's still in the political discourse. But uh, academically, it's gone. It's, it's lost its credibility, even in Israel, but certainly everywhere else. And the second thing that gives me uh, some source of hope. Oh, hope is the shift that I see, especially among young people, towards a better understanding. You know, sometimes with limits and, you know, with with gaps, 
but a better understanding than their elders have of what's actually going on, of the actual dynamics in Palestine. And I think all of the talk about anti-Semitism and all of the, the fury about Zionism and anti-Zionism obscures the fact that basically they've got it right to a greater extent than their elders. Their elders were sold a bill, there's an American expression, they were sold a bill of goods. The miraculous establishment of Israel, this is redemption after the Holocaust, this is a refuge for the persecuted Jews of Europe, this is a, a realization of a biblical promise. All of that overshadowed, overshadowed the realities of ethnic cleansing and massacre and dispossession and theft of land and, 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 and oppression ever since then of the Palestinians in different ways which was the precondition for all of these things. Now, I think students, younger people, students especially, but younger people generally, and many other people in the West, I would argue most trade unions, many, many liberal churches, very large sectors of the Jewish community, especially young people, are coming to a realization about the, this is the other side of this. This is the, that, and that to me is very encouraging. Das Interview hat Dessa Schischkowitz mit dem Historiker Rashid Khalidi für den Berliner Tagesspiegel am 15. Mai 2024 geführt. Bei den Kolleginnen und Kollegen des Tagesspiegel bedanke ich mich sehr herzlich. Das neue Buch Khalidis ist dieser Tage auf Deutsch erschienen. Es trägt den Titel Der hundertjährige Krieg um Palästina. Eine Geschichte von Siedlerkolonialismus und Widerstand. Das Buch kann im Falter Buchversand bestellt werden. Ich verabschiede mich von allen, die uns auf UKW zuhören. Eine Vielfalt von Einschätzungen zu den heißen Themen unserer Zeit finden Sie regelmäßig im Falter. Ich empfehle ein Abonnement des Falter. Alle Informationen gibt es im Internet unter der Adresse abo.falter.at. Ursula Winterauer hat die Signation gestaltet. Miriam Hübel und Clara Gottsauner Wolf betreuen die Audiotechnik im Falter. Ich verabschiede mich. Bis zur nächsten Folge. Sie hörten das Falterradio, den Podcast mit Raimund Löw.